Welcome back to another episode of Colony Drop, a Gundam podcast. My name is Brian. And my name is Isaac. This is your favorite Gundam podcast where we talk about anything and everything that is related to Gundam. That could mean Gundam music, Gundam series, movies, concepts, lore, the Gunpla, of course, even Gundam amusement parks that are hypothetical and will in no way ever exist. <laughs> <laughs> Don't dash your hopes yet, Isaac. Maybe one day. Maybe. That's true. Well, yeah. All right. You got me there. You got me. We live in such a unique world, right? Who who knows what will happen in the future? Right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. So today, Isaac, we're going to dip into the lore a little bit. The lore, the manga, some shorts. Wow. I think it's going to be a good time. So... Isaac, you'll know, you know that one of my favorite things about Gundam is all the little lore tidbits and some of the ace pilots. One thing I've wanted to do for a while is, is to look at some ace pilots, so I thought, what would be a better place to start than two of your favorite characters in Anna Gato, The Nightmare of Solomon, and Shima Garahau, The Mayfly of Space? These are two of the most complex characters in the Universal Century, if not all of Gundam. They've really had a dark horse role. I'm not sure what phrase I'm looking for. A dark horse role within the timeline that kind of like punches above their weight. They had such a huge impact for, in the grand scheme of things, being somewhat minor characters, right? Yeah, I mean, they weren't, you know, in one of the big 52, 50-ish episode series. They were in, you know, uh, 0083 Stardust Memory. So it's not like they were around in that many episodes in terms of volume but i think they're definitely fan favorites for the limited amount of time that they were in this series yeah and not only that they were just so well written you know their storylines the, the the surprises about them that we saw their piloting abilities especially shima herself for being on the short list of female pilots on the short list of female zeon pilots and on the short list of <laughs> I guess treasonous characters, <laughs> <laughs> treacherous characters, but but yeah, oh god, and and you know clearly that was noticed in Japan because they made this content, they made manga series and little OVAs that touch more on Shima and uh, and Gato especially. Yeah, so I think let's. I w- we were originally going to do just a Gato episode and just a Shima episode, but I think we're going to do both of them together tonight, and I think. That works out because if you go through some of Shima's stuff, they end up crossing paths a bit, uh, her and Gato. So that's that's fun. That's uh, that's a nice crossover. That's a nice uh, you know, coincidence to, to try to do this. Did you expect Gato to bleed over so much into Shima's? Um, no, actually. I, I, I mean, based on 0083, you could be forgiven for thinking that they might have heard of each other, but they never really interacted much, you right. know? yeah. But in as we saw in this new content, or not new, but after the fact new, I guess, um, <laughs> they, they definitely had crossed paths at least once. There was some shared history there. Not necessarily bla- uh, bad blood, though, which was kind of surprising for me. Mm. But yeah, 003 was not the first time they met. All right, listeners, so let's dive in here. So, Isaac, when I first heard the name The Nightmare of Solomon, my first reaction was like, that's pretty cool. That's, that's a cool name. I like that. My second reaction was... What did this guy actually do at Solomon to earn said nickname? Yeah. When you saw 0083, did you feel like we got a good sense of what he did at Solomon, or people just were kind of generally fearful of him? Not at all, because, you know, we're told his name. He's clearly an ace and very important. He's great at even infiltration missions, which aren't necessarily (laughs) something a pilot would do. Well, not necessarily great. I mean, the Federation security... (laughs) Yeah, maybe not the most difficult mission, depending on time of day when you walk by the Federation base. Yeah, I was giving him too much credit. Let me take that back. (laughs) But, you know, they didn't even do any flashbacks, if you remember. I mean, 0083 starts and they're showing us a Bawaku, but Gato doesn't really do a lot, you know. Right. We kind of just mainly see him in the hangar, so we're, we're told he's good, but we're not really shown he's good. This, though, oh, this shows that he was completely on the level of, you know, Char as far as being able to be a lone mobile suit that can take out fleets. And at the same time, it, he was so good. Amuro, you know, assumed he was a new type at one point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, or, or, or couldn't believe he was not a new type, I should say. But, but yeah, it, it was good to see, you know, where the name The Nightmare Solomon came from and how he could single-handedly take down a fleet. Exactly. And so, listeners, what if I told you that there were three adaptations, at least three that I'm aware of, of Gato at the Battle of Solomon? Did you realize that there were three of these, Isaac? There's just, like, so many. Like, that's a lot, even for Gundam. 
Yeah. I mean, <laughs> no, I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it makes sense because of what a, what a long shadow uh, Gato casts over the UC. You, you know, like, I assume next to Char, he's the most widely known ace from the One Year War. Yeah, I'd stand by that as far as on the side of Zeon. You know, I know Zeon had a lot of other aces, and they all had, like, their own little mangas and stuff, but I feel like only Gato has had his little series, you know, flashing back and right. the manga on top of it, right? Yeah, Gato's definitely up there. I, I don't know if I could name a, someone between him and Char, so at least for that time period, maybe if you go into other, you know, Zeta, et cetera. But the first time that they adapted this, now keep in mind, remember, listeners, that 0083 came out in 1991 90, through 92. So the first adaptation of... Gato and Solomon was called Mobile Suit Gundam 0079, The Nightmare of Solomon. It came out in 1993. It was a manga one-shot, which uh, one-shot basically means it's like a one-issue story. So roughly, you know, somewhere between 20, 25 pages usually. It was written, illustrated by Tsukasa Kotobuki. And (laughs) I think the defining thing about this one, Isaac, is two things for me. One, in this one, which has been retconned in the subsequent adaptations, but in this one, he uses his Gelgoog, his blue and green Gelgoog, which you don't like. But in addition to using the Gelgoog, Isaac, he uses this massive beam rifle, which is so cool. And if you're ever looking up Gato on the the internet back in the early 2000s, you probably saw this picture of him in his Gelgoog holding this enormous beam rifle, which is twice the length of his of his Gelgook. Yeah, this is like it looks like something that'd be like a sniper rifle. He definitely didn't need to use it at long range though cuz he just, <laughs> you know, he'll he'll stand next to like the bridge of a Solomus and blow it up. But yeah, like I guess since this was a prototype or one of the early beam rifles for Xeon, they they just couldn't get it compact yet. So it's <laughs> it's almost like the as the length of like a main gun on like a a Musai or a capital ship. Yeah, it's amazing. And so a brief summary of this, it takes place at the Battle of Solomon, obviously. During this battle, Gato, is, he's part of the Xeon Space Force. He's part of the 302nd Patrol Squadron. He's out there with Karius, Chief Petty Officer Karius at this point, who Karius. is through, you know, he's with us in 83. So it was nice to see Karius here, Isaac. Yeah, again, that was another thing where, well, they told us they, you know, worked together, but we never actually saw Karius at all in the flashback we never saw him at a Bawaku, to my knowledge and then we didn't even see him in the hangar bay of um delaz's ship so right to see him here in the the, the squad was like oh this is amazing you know even even Karius is here it's, it's a full a full throwback you know yeah you're getting not only the gato story but you're getting the whole crew along with it they're they're, they're using gato as the vehicle to give you a, a lot of people that were in double 83 right so and Karius here, Isaac, did you notice they put him in a Dom, which is a nice touch because he pilots the uh, the Rick Dom 2 in Double Eighty Three, so they had him in the same suit, which I thought was what I thought was fun. Yeah, it's good for him to uh, stick to what he knows. <laughs> <laughs> to his credit, he lived. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Karius is uh, he's the man. Uh, so Karius sees the big Zom launch, and they and he wonders if they plan to abandon Solomon. D- was your interpretation of that to mean if they didn't launch the big Zom, they were doing well enough that it wasn't needed? That was how I took it. It was a little okay. bit awkward, but yeah, I I, that, yeah. I interpreted it to mean like, oh man, if the big Zom is going out, things must not be going well. Okay, so at that point, it was just still very prototype, and you know, yeah. we we dare not send it out unless the situation is desperate. Okay. Gato at this point is lieutenant, and he's in a dom, and uh, Kelly Lazner, he's in a big row. They both wake up from being hit by the solar system, which I thought was a great touch, Isaac. We didn't know that Kelly's arm was taken off by the solar system. So when I when I was writing notes for this, Isaac, I accidentally wrote that Kelly's arm is toast. And then I realized <laughs> that I had made a bad joke. <laughs> Not a bad joke, Brian. A proper joke. It, w- it was accurate. Like a sniper rifle. <laughs> but yeah, like Kelly, it looked like when he got hit, like a third of him got cooked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it didn't look pretty. I mean, and we didn't even know that he was in a big row up until this point, did we? No, but that, again, that makes perfect sense because who better to fly the Valvaro three years later than someone that was in another mobile armor, right? Yeah, very similar to the Valvaro, just yeah. not as cool, right? So. And, and shout out to the uh, the engineers or design team that made the Xeon um, <laughs> flight suits because <laughs> aside from Kelly's arm, like his face is fine. You know, half of his yeah. helmet looked like it was melted, but his face withstood whatever happened. 
it looked gr- pretty gruesome r- regardless. You know, nothing good was going on in that cockpit. No. So Gato and Kelly, they end up getting back to the Delos. So they're on the Delos, and Gato asks for another mobile suit. You know, they're very similar to what we saw in 83 at about coup, but here we're, we're in Solomon. That, maybe that's why this got retconned a little bit. Gato asks for another mobile suit, and one has arrived from sent, you know, expressly by Dozel, and it's the Gelgoog, and it comes with this enormous beam rifle. And the fact that it even has a beam rifle is a shock to Gato. He refers to it as like that beam rifle, which I'm assuming he's referring to the RX-78's beam rifle, which he's probably, up to this point, heard so much about, right? Like, Yeah. So I thought that was good. Dozel puts Gato in charge of reforming the mobile suit forces after the battle. He's basically going to stall them, Isaac. He has to stall the Federation forces so that the, the, the Delos can retreat and they can, you know, live to fight another day. And so he does that. He basically lights all the Federation ships up. You know, he draws off from, from Kai and the gun cannon and like he said, we get praise from Amuro here. Amuro flies by stating that, uh, you know, Gato is strong enough not to rely on new type abilities and is a, I believe, what does he call him? Like a true ace pilot, I think. Yeah. He's like, that's, you know, I think first he was like, I can't believe there's no new type energy or whatever coming from that mobile suit. You know, I, I must be dealing with like a, you know, an actual just ace pilot or something like that. That must be just an ace pilot. The Immortal Fourth team fly by. That was cool. That was a good cameo. <laughs> Seen burning. Yeah, yeah. We saw burning and Mancha, I think, right? Yeah. And then after that, Sela flies by in the G Fighter. But it's also like the bustiest version of Sela that I've ever seen. So that was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I saw her and I was like, I think that's a new character. And then I was like, oh, it really is Sela. <laughs> nope. Because like her face, well she's at a very unique angle right like they kind of did sure. this yeah, yeah. cockpit style angle that's kind of like a fisheye lens or something yes but yeah yeah you you would have to be told that say that otherwise i thought that was oh a female pilot number five or something you know <laughs> <laughs> that normal suit is barely hanging on is all i'm saying uh, so. <laughs> but on to the mission isaac gato destroys eight ships i think he destroys three magellans and five uh, salamis Zeon fleet escapes and he earns a two rank promotion and overall isaac i gotta say i really enjoyed this this one shot manga it, it had great panel layout great panel design it was tightly paced there was only 20 pages in this manga so it's not a lot to really tell your story and i felt like i really got it i you know seeing the beam rifle using the, you know, the blacks and the whites i thought it was really well done did you enjoy this one even though it involved the, the gelgoog and not his dom <laughs> I, I enjoyed it because of how much it fleshed it out compared to like the rest of the content we might talk about tonight. This one might have been the most comprehensive. Yeah. As far as I showing agree. just a, a slice of Gato's life during the one year war, a slice of, you know, his little squadron during the one year war and how he actually earned the name. Agreed. And so one note on the, the rifle, because this is a bit unfortunate, Isaac. And so. Listeners, in general, this this entire one shot has now been retconned because now the official lore is that he used his Dom at Solomon, not his Gelgoog. He didn't use his Gelgoog until about a coup. So fine. But they also retconned the, the rifle, Isaac. The rifle is no longer in existence. They now retconned it into another Gelgoog rifle, the same one that the ground Gelgoog uses. And it's, it's a better looking rifle than like a normal beam rifle, I guess, but it's not as big. And... When they made the Master Grade Gato's Gelgoog, they put the new rifle in it, not this the Good. big one from this manga. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. I thought you might be no. one. Okay. No, so I actually have Gato's Gelgoog, the Gelgoog Master Grade. I really wish there was a way to get the the long rifle from this manga. So if anyone out, I, I guess I got to go check out like, you know, some 3D printing websites. Maybe someone out there makes it. But if anyone has any good leads, I would love to buy one of these giant beam rifles. <laughs> it's probably going to be like, you know, $50 based on the amount of plastic that this thing would require. But every time I see this rifle, Isaac, I, I think of like, your big sniper rifle that you want for your your orange uh, Gelgoog or whatever. It's not long enough. It's not dense enough. It's it's still not large enough, Brian. <laughs> but you know what? Uh, at least yeah, at least Zeon was was thinking thinking in the same ballpark at least you know <laughs> in the early days. Anything else on that one, Isaac? Or should we move to the second one? You know, I don't remember Gato's flagship at the time being at Solomon. Right? Was was that actually at Solomon? I thought they were just. Always kept back at um, Zeon Homeland. I don't recall. It's you know it could be one of the reasons why this was retconned. You know, oh, okay. I, if anyone out there knows why this was retconned to being the Dom, is it perhaps that the Gelgoog was not introduced 
during Solomon. I can't remember if that's huh. right. Or at okay. least maybe maybe Shar has his has his, but no one else has one yet. I mean, it it, it kind of raises the question of like, why did Admiral Tianum not hit it <laughs> when he had the chance with the with the solar system? Right? Like, was was the captain in charge of that ship like that good? Like he could just kind of, you know, he, or if he was that good or that lucky, they just didn't get hit and they had time to go back and get ready for Bawaku. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the first time we saw him was at Bawaku, so I think you might be right. But this this could just be one of those instances, Isaac, of like, hey, this looks cool. Let's put it in a manga, and, and we're not gonna care too much about it. And then someone later came along and was like, actually, this doesn't, you know, this doesn't go along with the the right sequence of events. So we have to change this up I a see. bit. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Either way, it made no difference <laughs> because Zeon yeah. still lost both battles. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. I mean, one thing I do know about the Gelgug, for example, is that over the years, I think the original lore, if I recall. They they said there was a certain amount of Gogoogs, and then over the years they've gradually expanded that number, just because the number of side stories have grown. And like you know, if you start giving everyone Gogoogs, and originally you said that there were only, you know, I'm just gonna make up a number. If there were only 25 Gogoogs, but then you do 30 years of side stories, well, you've given out too many Gogoogs at that point, right? So you you then need to you know retcon your lore a bit and say, well, actually we made a few hundred. Right. So, you know, it could be one of those cases, but if anyone knows definitively that that would be interesting to hear. So, yeah, that kind of makes sense too, because I feel like the Gelgu has gotten weaker over time too. Right. For at first it was released and it was, Oh, this is, you know, essentially a match for the Gundam. And then over time right. it was, well, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, the way I would always interpret it is like the specs are as good as the Gundam, but not everyone's Amuro Ray. Right. Uh, yeah, well, you, even then, I think in combat, it's, it's still not the same, but but I digress. <laughs> okay, so that was the first attempt at adapting the Nightmare of Solomon. The second attempt, Isaac, came in 2003. There was another manga, again, called Nightmare of Solomon. This one was written and illustrated by Masato Natsumoto. This one was a little bit more straightforward, Isaac. I think this one was even less pages. I think it was only 15, if I recall, 15, 16. I would describe it as the concise version of what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's much the same thing, right? But without a Gelgoog and without the beam rifle story. If you had explained to someone in an elevator what happened, like, this is the version you would show them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Gato took out his dom and blew up some ships, yeah, right? Like, so there was a battle, they were in space, and then it was over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he pretty much, we opened with some Federation forces advancing on Solomon. Gato's waiting in his Rick Dom on the Delos, and the Rick Dom is holding uh, the, big, the big beam bazooka, which I believe is called the EX... Uh, dash t2 dash 2 beam bazooka right and he launches he beats up some some gyms <laughs> which to their credit that beam bazooka is way more reliable than the prototype beam rifle he got handed <laughs> in the other anime <laughs> like the, this beam bazooka like we've never heard anything bad about it right like it, no, it always no, works <laughs> yeah. yeah it wasn't prototype at all right it was just this thing is great it's very well engineered yeah he takes out a magellan i think and then I think the is it the captain of the Magellan Isaac that that says you know he asks himself like is this a nightmare and that was kind of the way that, that he took his name I suppose yeah I, although I, you think he like accidentally hit like a broadcast switch and like everybody in Zeon <laughs> heard it <laughs> and they were like oh wow that's a great name God <laughs> <laughs> striking uh, yeah I don't know I mean I think that was a good way to give him his name but you're right I don't know how anyone else would know about it so. And that's kind of it, Isaac. He kind of just blows up some ships. You know, I guess the one thing here, Isaac, we do see it returning to the ship at the end of the manga. We don't know what happened to his dom. So I don't know. What's your headcanon for where it went, Isaac? I mean, it, it did lose an arm in this battle, but I'm going to assume that's because he fired the bazooka too many times and he blew his yeah. own he blew his own arm off because he didn't return with the bazooka. He must have left it out there. Yeah. You, you kind of have to decide for yourself what exactly went on to happen at Abawaku. Was he still in a Gelgu at Abawaku and it either needed to be rearmed too long or repaired? And that's why he made that desperate attempt to try to get into a, a dom when uh, Delaz was trying to talk to him. Yep. Or did he have a dom and still the same thing happened? Essentially, it needed to be repaired or, you know, rearmament was taking too long, refueling. That's why he made a desperate attempt to try to get into someone else's dom. And that person, by the way, apparently used like a lock or something because he had some trouble trying to get in, remember? And DeLaws had time <laughs> to like right. catch up to him. <laughs> hey, don't go Once in Once again, Zeon thinking ahead. Yeah. <laughs> 
locking the equipment. But only for themselves. No, no one else uses these locks. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Like in the middle of a, a battle as important as a Baoku, would you like want things unlocked? Maybe <laughs> so you can get to them faster. But I, Yeah, I think that would be the only time you want them unlocked, right? When you're... Yeah. On your own ship in the middle of the battle, that that would be the one time to keep things unlocked. Y- you know what? Actually, no. Because I, I assume among the pilots, by that point, they knew how rare their mobile suits were, how how costly it was to actually get them. So mm. I, I assume one pilot, or at least maybe more than one, wisely decided to put a lock system in. That way he <laughs> knew if something happened and someone tried to take my mobile suit, it would not happen. <laughs> 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 Although we will see uh, in when we talk about Shima that Dom, that Gato did end up piloting that Dom, so yeah, true. So Isaac, I don't know, but this one, like you said, I, I I think I enjoyed this one a lot less than the first one. Yeah, you know the the plot, it just wasn't as specific. There just wasn't as good panel layout. Just not as much substance to this one. No, I don't want to say that it's a bad manga. But when you read them back to back, it's hard to like this one more, I think, than the first one. Yeah, you get the same uh, story beats, but it's uh, you get a little bit less on your plate. It's the bread yeah. and butter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Isaac. So then, that was back in 2003, Isaac. That was like almost 20 years ago. So enter, I think, 2021, or maybe this year, maybe 2022. 2021 or 2022, a new mobile game came out. It was called UC Engage. Um, I think we may have mentioned this on another podcast, but... And honestly, it's pretty hard to find info about this this game because it's not available. You can't play it in English. Surprise, surprise. But it's basically a mobile game. And it's like a six on six battle thing. I think you you know you you give some touchscreen commands. And but there are a lot of anime cutscenes. And there's also an original story. Um, and this game is famous for having sort of animated Moon Gundam for the first time. Wow. It did this Nightmare of Solomon short, which we're about to talk about. And it did another short where Shima fights the GPO-4, which has never been animated before, except for, I think, in Gundam Evolve. Um, so it's animating a lot of cool stuff, Isaac. It's kind of like the old video games from maybe the mid-2000s, where th- those had a lot of cool cutscenes that animated a lot of stuff that hadn't been animated before. But I can't really find a whole lot of good English summaries about the game. If, if listeners, if you know of one in a nice summarized fashion, consolidated fashion somewhere, we I think we would like to read it. As far as I know, Isaac, the original story revolves around this uh, new type girl named Pesh Montaigne. And I'm just going to read her description from the wiki. Sure. Uh, she's a, a new type candidate trained by the Flanagan Institute. She volunteered as a pilot to succeed Captain Oregon, a technical officer in the Zeon Army, and her adoptive father. However, her mobile suit piloting skills are far from perfect, and her new type abilities are very weak. She pilots the Gundam Development Test Unit Zero, also known as the N-Gage Zero. And I think this is basically either the first Gundam Development Project suit replacing the blossom which is the you know gp00 mm-hmm. or it could be it could be coming before it because hers is just unit zero you see what they did there isaac so they, they already had double o unit one unit two unit three unit four so now they made hers unit zero it's like a single zero instead of a double zero <laughs> another creative way to get another one in there or it's otherwise just adjacent to the gun <laughs> development project altogether maybe it's happening because it happens in double o83 isaac so it's like around the same time at this point, they're going to do like, oh, oh, by the way, there was a negative series. You know, there's there's, <laughs> there's negative one, and then a negative two, and, and you know, negative two is almost stolen. You know? <laughs> Where's the, there's that side story. <laughs> you know what? I would still read it. Probably. Gundam ends, you know, the negative series. Ooh. <laughs> I know in the game, at least, she it takes place, I think, in 0079, in 0083, and maybe even 0087. So she you kind of follow this Pesh girl sort of throughout the years, and... um. I don't know. It's one of those side story games. I would like to, you know, play it or at least watch all the cutscenes one day uh, with some subtitles. Some of them are available. You can see some subtitles. The one we're about to talk about a little bit later ha- had none, but this Gato one did. So there was an event in the game, Isaac, where they they did the Nightmare of Solomon event, and they just they animated for the first time, you know, Gato at Solomon. And we kind of just watched the animated version of the second manga ad- adaptation. And to its credit, I think it was better than the manga adaptation, but it was still pretty short. <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of segments of it that were, I don't know the proper animation term, but a still image that's moving. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not not specifically, you know, different cells or actual animation moving itself, but just us moving across a, an image that's static um, with, yeah. with sound effects or voiceover. Yeah. So that, eh, not, not terrible, but at the same time, I was kind of like, eh, this is kind of an anime <laughs> kind of a jpeg <laughs> it's the nightmare of solomon on a budget all right yeah. 
This is your mobile game budget. But yeah, the short, I mean, you, you know, listeners, you can find this on YouTube, you know, just search Nightmare of Solomon, you see Engage, and you'll, you know, you'll find it. It starts out right away, Isaac, Gato, he just assaults the ship. There's not a whole lot of lead in. He's in his dom, which is in the color scheme, which you, I don't think you like, right? You get the blue dom with the sort of the green armor. Nope. I, Isaac votes no. That that will not <laughs> appear in the Isaac fleet. <laughs> You're banned. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he has some good lines here, Isaac. He says, I will not let you tarnish the glory of Zeon, at the very least become a funeral flame and burn. That's pretty good. He destroys, I think I think I counted six ships in one minute, which is, which, that's pretty great, right? Yeah, yeah, he's living up to his name. And <laughs> One thing here, Isaac, is we do see the fourth team. They're in some gyms, and they see him fly by, and burning this time is the one that says, this is a nightmare, because he's, you know, he's observing all these ships go down to this one mobile suit yeah you know what this might be a case of where the name really came from the federation side and you know it was discussed among them hurting communications among them and then it made its way to zeon oh i agree i think this is the best adaptation of of the name origin for sure burning giving it to him is is a pretty good i I like that probably yeah the immortal fourth team lived watched all this mayhem reported back and then from there just you know the constant I don't know, Zeon was listening in or whatever. However things transpired, yeah. the name made itself famous. And you know what I like about this appearance by the fourth team, Isaac, is that did you notice that one of them is in a Jim Cannon 1? And I assume it's the same one who pilots a Jim Cannon 2 in 083. Oh, a mustache, right? Yeah, uh, was that a... Uh, uh, I don't remember whatever if it was Bate or Adele. He, one he, of the two. Yeah, he was the only one that was kind of good. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The one that clearly guy. respected other people. <laughs> yeah. Not. Yeah. Not Mancha, who just was a, a pig, and yeah. then the other guy who was also kind of a. Yeah. The other guy who who clearly supported what Mancha was doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was like the enabler, right? Yeah. It's like you're not you're not helping. <laughs> <laughs> so I I think this was a fun watch, Isaac. You kind of get to see Gato just blow through a whole bunch of capital ships with the beam bazooka. So if if that sounds great to you, listeners. Just look it up, and I think you'll enjoy it. There's a few other cameos. We do get to see Kelly and his damaged Big Row. So they kept they kept Kelly in the Big Row, which is, a, I think, a good lore addition. You get to see Shin Matsunaga. Yeah, he's in it for a little bit, yeah. Yeah, that was unexpected. That really had nothing to do with the story. That was they, I think they just threw that in there, like, ha-ha, look, a Shin cameo. Yeah, it was like one one segment of one page. or Yeah, it was so brief. I was like, why is he here? And then he was gone. <laughs> yeah, we, I will have to do another episode on him because this this part didn't even really make sense unless you knew something about him. So uh, that was a little odd. I'm trying to remember. Was Kelly's big row? Was that the same color scheme as as Gato's mobile suit? No, oh, I don't remember. I don't think I looked at the okay. color. I'd have to go watch it again. Okay, I could have sworn it was kind of a greenish blue, which um could be. Maybe they had like a friendship pact. Yeah, maybe that was their like little squad color. They were twinning. Yeah. <laughs> so after watching or after you know consuming all these three things about solomon isaac i have to wonder you know knowing also what he did in in 083 with you know nuking the fleet and taking out the noise zeal he has to have the highest kill count of any zeon pilot right in terms of raw lives taken maybe not ms kills but in terms of like bodies put in the bag yeah at this point he's like rivaling the targeting engineer (laughs) <laughs> the, the the press the button on the solar array, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's like the only person that's kind of close, you know? Yeah, because you got to think there's how many yeah. people in each one of those ships he takes out? At least a hundred, right? Right. P- possibly the captain that hit like the, the nuke trigger that took out a few colonies would be close, also. But um, yeah. At the same time, you know, those aren't technically combatants. So right, yeah. You know. he's doing this in a mobile suit. So yeah. And in 083, you could even count that he he was the last one to touch the colony before it hit the Earth, too. So I would give him credit for uh, whatever that took out. Yeah. Oh, God. I still wonder about that. Like all 10 farmers that he killed, but, you know, <laughs> all four farmers running for their lives on their horses. <laughs> Hauling ass on their John Deere to yeah, get out of the way. It's like I don't think we have anything to worry about. That colony's headed straight for South America, and then they just get like <laughs> you know an emergency notification text. They're like, "Oh my god, <laughs> don't they know we make food for the whole sphere?" Um, <laughs> did Gato do something in the command center to like lock the controls? I'm pretty sure he said something like, "I've locked the controls," 
in the colony, right? In double eighty three. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He was okay. the one to finally redirect it. So he did. Yeah, I think he did that, and he probably locked it so no one else could change. It. <laughs> and Co didn't even attempt to like circumvent <laughs> the log, right? Or like call Federation Tech to support and say, "Hey, I'm oh, in the colony. Co. Like, give me like the you know the skeleton key code or something." <laughs> yeah. Or wouldn't you at least like shoot all the panels to try to mess it up? No, uh, I, no, that do might it. do more harm than good. But like, <laughs> isn't there someone in like Federation IT who can like backdoor? <laughs> the system or something and like we can put the calling to the ocean <laughs> maybe he called him but he, he, the the wait time was too long yeah it's busy like oh you know what's your membership number and <laughs> can you press con- three can you to- confirm your date of birth <laughs> so you know what i'm leaving <laughs> good luck so uh, i guess isaac do you think the beam bazooka had a good showing here and then do you do you think the beam bazooka is better than the the Gelgoog beam rifle in the other one? Ooh, ooh. Um, well, looks wise, I kind of like the prototype beam rifle first. Yeah, and that's because it just it looks so cool. It's kind of like this sinister looking sniper rifle, um, very zionic, but it overheated and all that. Yeah, we know the beam bazooka performs better and is way more reliable. My issue with the Bean Bazooka has always been, I've always felt it's too bulky for its own good. Like almost yeah. almost no other weapon, Federation or Xeon, is that size. <laughs> it, it works, but it's just, you know, at a certain point, it's like, well, th- this weapon is almost twice the length of the mobile suit using it. Like, we, we, we should have done something to, to compact it more. You know, we should have put way more man hours into compacting it. <laughs> yeah, you need you need some escorts when you go out in that thing, right? Because at some point, when you run out of ammo, you're kind of just dead weight with that thing. It reminds me of the full armor Devil Zeta bazooka. Oh, I, God. Uh, like a smaller scale of that. Yeah. Oh, well, that thing, I would imagine, is even scale wise, it's not even as long, right? Because the Double Zeta full armor bazooka is not twice the length of the Double Zeta. No, but it's no. pretty bulky. Yeah. It's <laughs> <laughs> at a certain point, the weapon's just too long. It's the Jormigan problem, right? Where it's like, yeah. well, you're going to have to stay in the back and shoot. You're going to be a glorified <laughs> sniper, you know? So. <laughs> okay, well, I enjoyed those three adaptations. So if you're a fan of Gato listeners, I encourage you to seek them out. The UCN Gage short is available on YouTube, you know, not officially, right? But uh, And then the two manga adaptations, those were translated by Zionic. He puts everything out for free. Uh, I think he actually just started a Patreon uh, recently, so, you know. If you like his work, you know what to do. <laughs> Hand him that money and get your dreams come true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what did you think, Isaac? Are you satisfied by the uh, Nightmare of Solomon tale? Or do you do you feel he earned his name? I feel like he did. I feel like he earned his name, but I'm not satisfied. And I'm not satisfied to the extent where I mean... I'd like a full blown series, you know. I'd mm. like a little. Uh, yeah. y- you could you could even do a back and forth with him and the Immortal Fourth team. We all know where it's headed. We all know where it's going. We know they're not going to die, but along the way, we just get to in, you know enjoy the journey of the one year war from from their perspectives. I think someone actually just left left us this comment that there's a great opportunity for them to do like an anthology series. You know, we're seeing that a lot on like streaming, right? For uh, there's Disney's doing that a lot for Star Wars, right? They're making kind of these single episode things that fill in the lore gaps it would be great to just have one episode about the nightmare of solomon one episode about shin matsunaga one episode about johnny Ryden. you know you could do uh really entertaining things i think in 22 minutes and get a lot in there i, I think a lot of people would enjoy it and i it feels like a no-brainer to me isaac but it must just be too expensive or something i don't know yeah i mean a sunrise is, is certainly smaller than a lot of the major streaming platforms and and entertainment companies and neither of us really know how things are kind of planned over there how the numbers are crunched before the proverbial pen even hits you know the paper but yeah there is a gundam universe full of content side stories events that happened and there's a lot of blank pages on the canvas it could absolutely be filled out maybe in a few years brian the ai will get so good it can just start pumping out animation <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, maybe. <clears throat> so what I'm taking away from this, Isaac, is we just read three adaptations of the same event. And what you're saying is those were good, but you'd like to see a fourth. <laughs> I would like a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, because it's <laughs> it's amazing. And everybody likes Gato. I, I can't think of a lot of people that don't like Gato. People will <laughs> go out of their way to hate Nina. <laughs> Like, yeah, that's true. Like almost almost nobody likes Nina, I think, but everybody likes Gato. 
It's because he's such a well-known character, and why would we not want to see more of such a great character, such a great pilot? So you're almost there, Sunrise, but adapted a fourth time. <laughs> yeah, there's a pot of gold waiting for you. You just got to go over and get it. <laughs> All right, on to our second subject of the evening. Yay! Shima Garhau. Oh, boy. So this one's interesting, Isaac, because when we both you know, bought our 0083 DVDs back in the day. Oh, uh, back in the DVD day, so. Yeah. Brian, for, for our Zoomer listeners, can you explain the acronym DVD? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I believe it's did for digital video disc. It was a disc-shaped device, and you would put it in this player, and you'd hit play, and it, it had your media on it. Oh, yeah. If you were really lucky, it had, like, special features. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You could, you could, like, watch a DVD that had, like, uh, the director commentary or behind the scenes or things yeah, like that. Bloopers and outtakes and yeah. <laughs> and things, trailers. And, and speaking of special features, Isaac, so... Even when we bought the DVDs back then, there was a Shima special on one of the DVDs, and it was called uh, The Mayfly of Space. Right. And it was a short from 1992. Uh, it partially adapts what's called Mobile Suit Gundam 0083 Stardust Memory CD Cinema Episode 2. And my understanding is that this was some sort of uh, you know audio drama-ish type thing that was released as part of the soundtrack for either the show or potentially even the movie. And you got this short, but I think by buying one of the DVDs of the OVAs that either led up to the movie, uh, Afterglow of Zeon, one of our one of our favorites on this podcast, <laughs> or just maybe even the DVD of the, of the film itself. But anyway, they, they put this short on the original DVD release. And it's not, I wouldn't say it's an anime, Isaac. It's its uh, somewhere in between. I think the official title is like picture drama because part of it's animated, but part of it's just pictures, right? Right, yeah. And so this one's really short. I think it's only two, three minutes, right? It, it opens with Shima. She's on the Lily Marlene having a nightmare. She says she's been having nightmares for four years. And in this nightmare, she's in a Zaku floating outside of a colony, sort of abandoned. She's sort of out of control. And the nightmare recurs. You know, and then uh, I think when it recurs, some, someone's yelling at her, you know, Lieutenant Commander Shima, Lieutenant Commander Shima, and she's not responding. And we do get a glimpse of, of her, Isaac, prepping for the battle with these big spherical tanks, which we know that <laughs> that is the, the GG nerve gas. It sure is. It must have been a flashback to when she gassed uh, the one colony that, you know, was then used for Operation British. Yeah. And then after that nightmare, we see her launching her Gelgug Marine commander type as Delaz is giving the speech standing in front of GPO2 with, with Gato. So this one very lightly alludes to Shima's backstory, uh, which we don't really get a whole lot of in the actual show, right? We don't see that at all in the show, do we? No, and I mean, I know the original series was aired, and you know, for time considerations, there had to be edits, of course, but this feels like it would absolutely help flesh out her story more because her, her treachery kind of comes out of nowhere. You you really need to kind of almost read about her treachery if you're watching 0083 Blind to kind of comprehend what was happening. Yeah, absolutely. And I can even say that more so about the second uh, <laughs> Mayfly of Space short. This has to be a record here. Isaac. Again, Mayfly of Space 1 came out in 1992. Mayfly of Space 2 came out in 2016 that's 24 <laughs> episodes 24 years later i mean holy crap we, we, we have to clarify things the fan the shima fans are demanding more more explanation <laughs> <laughs> all right it's been 24 years yeah. throw him a bone <laughs> tomino just had an idea <laughs> <laughs> i mean how about that fandom though you know that where there's some demand i i guess they see it just a bunch of shima fans with like signs outside of sunrise headquarters like marching <laughs> and save shima save shima yeah <laughs> Yeah, maybe they were, you know, sending in like tiger skins or something to, to Sunrise, <laughs> demanding. That's an expensive. Yeah, content. that's a very expensive, if not possibly illegal, way to <laughs> to show your your demands must be met. <laughs> I don't think they they did it all for the fans. One, I think that was when I'm not positive on this, so maybe someone can confirm. But that was around the time when they released the Blu-rays, I think, for Double Eighty Three. So I think that was to drum up. Uh, some press for that and then also i think that's probably when the 0083 retelling manga started coming out rebellion which tells 0083 again but with some some, some alterations some pretty drastic changes actually but it sounds pretty cool maybe we'll read that and uh 
2023, Isaac. It's, it's a long one, but I think you'd enjoy it. Probably, yeah. <laughs> so again, 24 years later, we get this. We get the second part of Mayfly of Space. We open here on at a Balku, and we see the same animation of Gato's Gelgoog that we've seen so many times wreck that poor Jim with his beam saber. You know the one I'm talking about, Isaac, where the the Jim comes up and Gato just like smashes right on through him, and that Jim just disintegrates. Yeah, <laughs> gets bulldozed. That gym's got to be up there on, like, the grunt that dies so many times and people watch it and go, man, that was cool. Yeah, I have to wonder at this point, like, was that guy also an ace or, like, a pretty good pilot? And he was like, oh, that's the Nightmare of Solomon. I'll watch, <laughs> guys, watch this. <laughs> you <know>? Boom. <laughs> yeah, it was like a water balloon exploding. Brave, I'll give him that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure what his strategy was, but it didn't work out. <laughs> strategy, get as close as you can to the nightmare of Saul. <laughs> <laughs> and so after that, the Zeon fleet is retreating from E-Field. And so if you've watched Igloo, Mobile Suit uh, Gundam Igloo, they did a pretty good explanation of how they, you know, Zeon split the fields into letters. Uh, I think it was for the directions, right? There was N-Field, S-Field, E, right. W-Field. And no sooner that I had remembered this, Isaac, because I saw that field and I was like, oh yeah, I remember when they talked about this in Igloo. And... If you look closely on the screen, Isaac, there are icons for the uh, the Jotunheim and the oh, Cuspin wow. Battalion from Igloo. They're on Shima's radar screen, and I uh, I paused it, and I love it. I can't believe they, you know, because they, they couldn't have done that back in 1992 because Igloo hadn't come out. But now it's 2016. Igloo is, you know, almost 20 years old at that point, so they put it in. I liked that a lot because, remember, in Igloo, the Jotunheim and the Cuspin Battalion were acting as screens for Zeon to escape about Baku, so I thought that was pretty fun. Brian, Gundam content and lore ages like fine wine or, or, <laughs> does, or right. stinky French cheese. It just gets better. <laughs> <laughs> it does. I thought it was great. I liked it. The Federation fleet of Salamis and Jims tries to break through a Gelgoog marine group decked out in camouflage, Isaac, and that is basically Shima's force. They're, they're called the M- MAU Shima, which stands for Marine Amphibious Unit. What did you think about this camouflage <laughs> pattern, Isaac? Number one, not a lot of water in space. So I'm not <laughs> sure why amphibious was required. Um. <laughs> I took it. It was, it was the sea <laughs> metaphor, right? Solomon's Sea, it's a capital <laughs> ship. Uh, but I agree, it's very confusing. Yeah. We don't we don't usually see amphibious used if, out in space. If Admiral Isaac was running the show, things would have gone much better. Let me just say that. <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> number two, I I read about this camouflage and how it would cause problems. You know, looking at it if you're using an optical sensor, like you know yeah. the cameras that you know, everybody uses in their mobile suits, and you know, seen it in motion and stuff, like, I absolutely bought it, you know, at first I was like, oh, this is kind of a weird leopard print kind of thing, and then, mm-hmm. you know, as I was seeing them flying, especially towards the viewer, towards the camera, the screen, um, I was like, oh, this is awesome, like, I had no idea how to be able to paint this, but it looks cool. <laughs> that, that was exactly my thought, too, I was like, this is great. Yeah. I would not want to paint this on a, on a model. No, it, it's impossible. <laughs> if anyone can pull it off, like, I don't know. You deserve like a Gundam medal, or you you, you get yeah. you deserve a flight to Japan, and then you get to meet like you know Sunrise, and you know they shake your hand to take a picture, and they're like, "Wow, you did it." <laughs> <laughs> could you imagine though? You're that guy that's like so good that you can you can do this paint job, and then you you enter in the contest, and all everyone in the contest is like, "All right, here's my unicorn, here's my Gundam Ariel, here's my." strike freedom all these main suits and then right. like they get to you and you're like well here's my Gelgoog marine commander from the the 2016 <laughs> short that that no one watched <laughs> painted in camo like i would vote for that guy but yeah the casual gunpla people might just kind of you know move on to the next model but I, th- I feel like people that are in the know especially experienced painters experienced gunpla people they that probably stopped them in their tracks right and they just yeah. just stare trying to deduce like how did you actually pull off that paint pattern by hand and i'm sure someone's done it so listeners if you have a good example of this let us know i think it's pretty cool so props to that person if if you pulled this off here isaac you know shima's and her her pals are basically engaging these gyms they're not doing too well uh, a new character kind of comes out of nowhere gail hunt he's a fugitive on the run i think from the federation or something He's featured more in 083 Rebellion, which I think this sort of drummed up some support for. Hmm. So I think we'll we'll leave his story to the Rebellion review if we ever get there. 
Because he doesn't really do anything in here, right? No, no, no. Other than, you know, show his face. But let's just say this. He looks like a criminal. <laughs> he, he does, yeah. He, he, looks, he looks clinically insane, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, that is not a face you want to see, like, at night or anything, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was a... Who, uh, Chappelle just... You know, not to, to go on a tangent, but Chappelle just hosted uh, oh, SNL, and he he called one of the um, Senate candidates observably stupid, <laughs> and uh, this guy Gail Hunt is observably a criminal, right? Yeah, like you look at that face and you're like, okay, I see who did the war crimes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it was clearly yeah, this. Man. It was him. Like we don't even need to interview anybody. It was him. Yeah, yeah. Um, she was Gal Goose. They get hammered. She gets hit. Her visor breaks. She says Zeke Zeon farewell. You know, you basically think she's gonna die. But she wakes up from another nightmare. It's the same as the first one, I think, this, or at least very similar from the first nightmare from the, the first May 5 space special. <laughs> one of her officers has to tell her, like, you can't sleep in your chair. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, go I to know, bed. <laughs> yeah, I know you're important, but, like, for your own health, for your back, you're a pilot. You need to lay in your bed <laughs> and go to sleep. <laughs> Get her a sleep number bed or, you know, one of those uh, bed in a box. Something. I think she'd sleep like a baby. Yeah. <laughs> Except now, Isaac, we're, we fast forward a little bit. We're in October 23 of 0083. This is the day that Gato brings Unit 2 with him to space. But when he gets there, two Salamis and their gyms attack him, which is something we did not see in the show, if I recall correctly. But Gato's there with his rendezvous force, and he uses a new rifle that I don't think we've seen the GPO-2 use before. Maybe it's a video game or something, but not an animation. He uses what's called the 135 millimeter anti-ship rifle, which fires a bullet that goes right through one of the Salamis and a GM. If you're that Jim, you gotta be sad, right? You're like, you see the bullet hit the Salamis, and you're like, ah, all right, I'm good, and then it still comes through and hits you too. That that's bad luck. <laughs> I'm not sure you have time to be sad, but yeah. <laughs> Or at least you think, like, well, like, I'm behind the ship. I'm not going to die, right? I think your final neuron was like surprise, and then you just feel nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and then oblivion. But yeah. <laughs> what did you think of the anti ship rifle? It was pretty cool. Again, at a certain point, like, I think Xeon's thinking was, all right, well, fewer mobile suits mean we just keep them further back and they just shoot farther. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it kind of works. Yeah. I mean, but then again, like, there's just so many waves coming that, you know, at that point, it becomes a numbers game and a race against the clock. But, yeah. But, but that's fair. it was still pretty cool. You know, I, I'm all for seeing, you know, cool sniper action. So Gato slices up some gems with his, you know, beam saber, and then a gem explodes in front of him, shot from behind, and who appears but a Gelgoog Marine commander type in Shima's colors. And at this point, Gato wonders, you know, is it Shima? Because I assume at this point, Isaac, he hasn't really seen her in four years. Yeah. Three, four years. Yeah, it's so, been a while. Yeah. <clears throat> and then we flash back, Isaac, to a Bawaku. People are arguing what to do. I think it's the laws, or I'm guessing it's the laws. This was in Japanese, so I, I can't tell what is. I don't know his Japanese voice offhand, but I assume it's the laws saying, you know, don't overreact. You know, we'll we'll go regroup with uh, Maharaja Karn at Axis. Yeah, good name drop. Yeah, yeah, get the the Karn family name drop. But then Isaac, we are subtly introduced to Shima's public enemy number one, Colonel Asakura. Shima is incredulous at this guy. Because he's telling her that she needs to give her ship, the Lily Marlene, to the Federation as compensation. I assume for surrendering. They don't really say it in here, but if you go look up the lore, he was in Mobile Suit Gundam, the original. Hmm. And he helped develop the nerve gas that was used inside too wow. by Shima's team. Un un unknowingly, I guess, by her. And he also supervised the development of the solar ray, which used Shima's home colony of Mahal, you know, as the base. This guy was like the the weapons development head project guy or something, right? Yeah. Wow. And you know what, Isaac? He's still listed as alive on the wiki. He's not wow. dead. He escaped. Isn't that nuts? Well, I was about to say, I could have sworn she would have killed him, but I, she well, clearly tried. <laughs> yeah. So she's so upset here because, and we're going to learn in a little bit here, but... So one, you know, not only did he make her gas the colony, not only did he use her own colony as a sol as the base for the solar ray, but now he's telling her to give her ship up. And so Shima just lashes out. She tries to go kill him. He's in his uh, red uh, chevet, but she's stopped by Gato in that prototype, what's known as the prototype Rick Dom's Wii, or Zwei. Maybe Zwei, I don't know. <laughs> which was really just a space tropin. <laughs> yeah, which is really what we think is probably just a, an accident, right? It, it seems like... So again, we talked about this in the WA3 review, listeners, but after Gato's, Gelgoog is damaged and he goes in, he tries to get into that red Dom Tropin, or at least what looks like a red Dom Tropin, 
and it's probably just an animation error or just a cool dom that they were like hey it's cool let's make it red but you know the lore has made it a rick dom 2 prototype with a dom trop and frame and it has a special name it's called the prototype rick doms y it's one of those examples of a nice, you know, ret- make your lore work kind of retcon thing, in my opinion. That's what I think, Isaac. I don't think they, they meant for that to be the prototype Rick Dom's Y from the get-go, right? Right, yeah. It was just a case of we already did our concept art. We already animated out the Doms that are going to be appearing in the series. Just recycle it. No one will notice. Unfortunately, anime, <laughs> anime <laughs> fans and nerds and weebs, we did notice. <laughs> but- you know there's that one guy at Sunrise who was like, they, you know what? They, they found it. They're, they're asking what the red dom is. He's like, God damn it! Now I gotta write like a paragraph. <laughs> oh yes, they made an Earth variant for tropical <laughs> and heat weather, but they were still in space, so they had to engineer the actual components for space use. But they just kept the aesthetics, and then they just shipped it to Earth later on. <laughs> <laughs> Boom! Roasted. There you go. <laughs> the lore is intact. So you know, Gato speeds in and stops Shima from killing Colonel Asakura in this red Rick Dom's Y that we saw briefly in, in the show, but did yeah. not see him actually take it out. So we'd see him take it out here, Isaac, and they clash. He tells her to calm down, not in a sexist way, but it certainly comes off as like, you know, he's telling the angry woman to like calm it down. It was, it was very got up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he's like, you should act in a manner more befitting of a soldier and wait for Zeon to rise again. And at this point, Isaac, we get a sense of how disillusioned I think she is with, with Zeon, right? I mean, She says, at this point, I'm already a war criminal. I might as well hang myself now. You know, she wonders what the rise of Zeon again has has to do with her. I think she's over it. Yeah, pretty much. She's, I mean, she she wanted to get revenge. She couldn't get revenge. And now she's being told, you know, oh, just stick around. Just hold on. But she rightly knew that she would be treated differently. If you remember Double Eighty Three at at Delage's throne room, Gato had nothing nice to say about her. And not only that, uh, Delage never really defended her. (laughs) Right. Yeah, she's been chewed up and spit out by the Zeon machine, yes. and I don't think she has any sympathy left. No, she's she's literally just a tool. The, the Galgu Marines have always been just a tool. So we flash forward to present in W83, and they are clashing sabers again here. I like this. It was a nice bit of camera work, I'll call it. So they were clashing sabers in the past. Galgu Marine versus Rick Dom's Y, and now you got the Galgu Marine and the GPO2. She, she she has a good line here, Isaac. She says, I escaped the noose thanks to you, Gato. I was like, oh, geez, that's direct. <laughs> so clearly, I guess you're to assume that Gato did stop her that day and she didn't kill Lieutenant Asakura. Yeah, we would have seen him him go down. Yeah. Could, could she have gotten away with it? I mean, he had his chevet. I think there were a few other capital ships with him and I assume mobile suits. She could have probably killed him in the chevet she would have taken out the chevet because no one would have stopped her right it's just a gelgoog approaching you, you wouldn't yeah. shoot it down per se but once she does shoot her down then i think everyone in the immediate vicinity is going to shoot her down so it would i think it was more of a suicide run right i mean she's got nothing left to live for at that point and she admittedly thinks that she's a war criminal at this point and they're mm. going to hang her anyway D- did you notice when she was having her like really brief fight with the gpo2 that I don't know what they made it out of, but her Gelgoog shield was able to take a direct beam hit. Oh yeah, yeah, that was. Uh, I think that was actually in the against the GPO four. But yeah, I, I did. I did notice oh, that. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that blew me away. Like I was like, why didn't they make everything out of that? Like we we never <laughs> see the shields be able to take a beam shot like that. Oh my god. Yeah, For, I did see someone arguing about that in the YouTube comments. They were like, this doesn't you know this doesn't make sense. Or she her shield shouldn't have survived. Some, what did someone say? Someone said, oh, the GPO-4's beam rifle was for rapid fire, not for single shots. So ah. maybe it wasn't that powerful or something. I don't know. Okay. Because oh, if you remember, yeah. remember when she uses the, the Gerbera Tetra at the end, she's got that beam machine gun. It's the same gun. Oh, I see. Okay. So it's it's so much weaker and it's just... Potentially. It's, yeah, yeah. It's designed for just scatter fire almost. I like that explanation. I'll, I'll go with it. Sure. And then, Isaac, we get the final nail in the coffin for Shima. So now she's in a bar. She's depressed. She sees it on TV. <laughs> Gail, the guy we saw earlier, he's she, turned himself in. Let, let's just say that she might be depressed, but she looks great. <laughs> she's, oh, yeah. She, she's, she put on her finest clothes and jewelry. <laughs> she did. She dressed to the nines, you know. And on TV, she sees that Gail has turned himself in to the Federation authorities, and she's surprised. And she gets this flash of Asakura yelling at her telling her that her fleet overstepped its military regulations and she will be penalized for dirtying the name of Zeon. And so that's it. That's her story, Isaac. This guy used her to gas the colony. 
and then blamed the gassing of the colony on her team instead of taking you know, the blame for it himself. It, it still doesn't even really come out and say it. I mean, you have to kind of connect the dots there, right? Yeah, you definitely understand a lot more. But um, the only way to really understand it is kind of putting your hands up in the, you know, a, that you were dealt a bad hand. That's life. You know, yeah. it, this is this is terrible. And that's that's really why I like Shima so much, because she is justifiably treasonous, I should say, justifiably treacherous. You know, when we see her in 0083, she's a, a glorified pirate at that point. So this fully explains why she's the way she is, why her crew's the way they are. They did what they were told. They were good Zeon soldiers, and they get stabbed in the back, treated like dirt after committing war crimes, of course. But from what we gleamed, they clearly weren't fully aware of what was happening. And if they were, regardless of whether they knew or not, she definitely had you know bad feelings after the fact. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think this makes, like you just said, this makes her and her team makes so much more sense to the point where like i'm shocked that they even put her in the show without putting this may of space stuff in the show yeah this 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 whole knowledge that we've had here and even before if you never if you never even seen these and you just kind of read up on what happened she's very much the tragic villain possibly not even a villain a, a character a victim of circumstances and um you know her choices other people's choices that's why i think shima is such a great multi-layered character especially in the face of so many other zeon characters and officers that we that we meet who are you know just just goose stepping goons yeah do you think maybe they didn't put it in the show because then you wouldn't want ko to kill her um because having seen this i don't want it i don't want shima to, to die i want her to go uh, kill Asakura. Yeah, you want the Shima story, the Shima revenge tale. Yeah. Which apparently, from what I read in some of the comments, does exist in a video game. <laughs> yes, yes. I believe she also maybe potentially doesn't, you know, things transpire a little differently in Rebellion as well. Ooh, so interesting. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think it was just a more of an issue of time. You know, like, well, we let's let's give everybody watching the, the very briefest, you know, threads of a reasoning behind why she's the way she is. You know, we'll only reference the gassing and all that and her poor reputation. But th- this stuff really dives much more deeper and gives us a, a full a full perspective. I wish they would at least would have put it in the movie, Isaac. Yeah. Although, remember that we did say that someone edited that and down to two hours and it came out to one, one hour, 59 minutes, and they were like, boom, done. <laughs> <laughs> the Mayfly of Space. So, did you have any thoughts on that bizarre name i mean she's never called in the series you know oh there goes shima she's the mayfi of space <laughs> you know i was wondering that before we started actually because i don't know too much about mayflies but you're right no one calls her that it's, it's not her name like nightmare solomon is gato's name it's only something that the the viewer knows her as or at least i assume it's, it's meant to you know refer to her it's not the same sort of ace pilot name I don't know a lot about mayflies. I guess if I go look up a mayfly, let, let's see. It, it looks kind of like a dragonfly. I actually did a little bit of reading as, as like, what's their symbolism in Japanese culture? Because, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> here in the United States, I don't think there's any symbolism for mayflies yeah, one way or the yeah. other. But apparently, I, I guess they have short lifespans or something like that. And mm. the, in Japanese culture, they're from what i read the little the very little bit that i read there that's exactly what they symbolize the the brief transience of life so i guess that fits her you know she had such a brief life died in her 30s always kind of around death i guess gassed the colony tried to go home and they used her colony as a solar ray <laughs> so shima you you, you poor woman <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense about the short lifespan. I mean, that I guess that's the commentary, right? She was dealt this bad hand and, you know, died at the age of 35. But yeah, but overall, I mean, we know so much more about Shima now based on this. And uh, there's actually still some more, which we haven't talked about. So at this point, we see uh, Gato nuke the Federation fleet. And then her team blows the mirrors off the two stolen reclamation colonies so they can cling together and, you know, do the little demonstration that nina did with and the glasses that really cool static where they get like way too close and the friction starts building up or whatever yeah yeah that was neat and then isaac something that was sorely missing from the show a great scene here we flash and she's in a room with none other than Basque om and he's showing yeah. her the new solar system plans the defense line plan 
and she mentions that he basically just told her that she will have her crimes cleared and she will take on new subordinates as part of something called the Titans. So there it is, Isaac. So, Brian, the question that I have for you is, is Bascom telling the truth or was there still a bullet with her name on it waiting for her? Oh, I still think there was a bullet with her name okay. on it okay. waiting for her. Don't you? Um, I'm going to say... I think I have to say yes, because I can't think of anyone from the colonies who became a Titan, let alone side three. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I I think that would, especially given their, well, I don't know. Would she be a hero to the Titans? See, see, that takes us back to our 0083 discussion where the Shima fleet by default were, were heroes because they were fighting to protect the planet from a falling colony. Man. The only, okay. The only way I think she gets out of it without a bullet to the head is if she kept some sort of incriminating evidence against Bascom from that meeting. Hmm. Like, okay, if you kill me, that's fine, but guess what? You know, I'm going yeah. to mail this meeting to every news organization in the world, and, you know, then you're going to get killed. So. See, I, I kind of buy it because Paptimus, like, as much discrimination as he faced, like, he rose the ranks and was, depending on who he was around, he was pretty tolerated, you know? yeah. You know, they needed talented people, so that that could be yeah, another reason well, to keep her. Especially if things get worse. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, so I don't know. Maybe it's a 50-50, but I I think unless she did something to preserve, it, to, to keep Basket Bay, there was definitely a bullet on her way. That doesn't mean that he would have done it. doesn't mean that she wasn't useful. Yeah, you know what? doesn't mean yeah. that she wouldn't have been a hero, but she's also a loose end, Isaac. You know what? I'm going to double down and say, I, I, I think just based on the fact that the Federation to their fleet announced that you know, we'll be working with the Shima fleet, um, even though a lot of officers like um, not even just Synapse, but that other officer in the Pursuit fleet was like really shocked at but what it, he couldn't believe what he was hearing. Just the fact that they announced it and they were, you know, working together at the critical moment. I, I'd say that, yeah, the, the offer was legitimate. OK, I think the offer is legit. I just don't know that, you know, T- tears definitely weren't shed when she died in, and, the, and the fleet no, and the Shima yeah. fleet was wiped out. Let's, let, yeah, definitely that. <laughs> Yeah, and in, in, in a year down the road, two years down the road, that doesn't mean he's not going to kill you then. Yeah, I'm I'm sure in the, the the carnivorous politics of the Titans, something would have transpired even if she was around, yeah. where maybe she would have been killed by Paptimus or or Jamatov. Who knows? Yeah, or you know, a training exercise gone bad. Yeah, who <laughs> you, knows? You know. Or or she just would have you know the Shima fleet would have been treated as the 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 cannon fodder of the Titans or something. We don't know. Right. <laughs> And Bascom was like so happy, <laughs> wasn't he? He was. He just had a. He was grinning from ear to ear. That like, guy, like a kid showing his new toy to like one of his new friends. That evil son of a. <laughs> you like that solar system? I made it across. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big plus sign. <laughs> well, now it's vaguely white supremacist. Yeah, it's there you, yeah. <laughs> She's like looking at like I guess that's a solar system. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't it used to have more mirrors? What happened? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you can take off your glasses. We're indoors. <laughs> <laughs> so right after this meeting, Isaac, we get to see her launch, uh, I assume for the first time, in the Gabura Tetra. Because if you notice, in the first time we see it in this Mayfly of Space, it still has two eyes. It still has a more Gundam-like face. Did you catch that? Yeah, I'm glad you caught it, too. I was At first I saw it, and I was like, that's the Gerber Tetra's body, but that's a Federation face. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like white, and like, I mean, the eyes were still green, I think. but the They were, the, but there were yeah. two, so. Yeah, the face itself was white, so I was like, oh, she hasn't customized it yet, or... I, now that I think about it, I have no idea in what state Anaheim actually gave it to them. Maybe they gave it to them in like the quasi Gundam state, and they're like, "Well, you guys can take it from here." I don't know at that what, at what point we were looking at it. Like, was it still in Anaheim possession or or what? Yeah, well, that's interesting because now we'll, we'll get to that third short here in a second. But you know, and then we get to see it in action a little bit more. But then we do get to see Co Killer again. <laughs> what I did like about this, they showed Co destroy the Lily Marlene again. And you see Shima look back at it, and she has a, this sort of grimace. And now that grimace means more, having watched this, these two shorts, particularly the second short. Yeah, I always liked the Lily Marlene. It was, I mean, all Zanzibars are kind of the same, but like as yeah. far as Zanzibars go, the Lily Marlene's like it's the white base of Zanzibar. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it was just it was a lot more sad this time, Isaac. And and again, because this wasn't in the show, you don't know that. Right, exactly. You just you feel the loss more, especially after she she saved it from a raw deal at the end of the one year right. war, and it was her home for like years. And yeah, 
what could have been. And then she has her quote here, which sums up the whole short, which is living in this world is like rolling the dice. I suppose I made a bad roll. Wow. But at the same time, I mean, she, you know, she did good just to get to that point, right? She was going to get screwed over multiple times and she, she still made it out, but her luck ran out basically. Yeah. You could even say her bad luck ran out. Um, (laughs) Yeah, that's true. But yeah, wow, God, what a great phrase that really, at least the first half at least, kind of applies to everybody. Each day, your whole life, really, is just a roll of the dice, and some days are going to be good rolls and bad rolls, and man, poor Shima. It just feels so much more tragic, you know, and 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 as tragic as it is, you do appreciate what a great character she is even more. At least I do, as a Shima fan. Yeah, I agree. Shima's a great character, and I'm happy that they made these shorts. I did read a little bit what happens to her in Rebellion. I think you'll be, I think you'll be pleased. Good enough for me. Also, we got to see the Gerbera again here, Isaac, and I wish they would make a Master Grade or at least a Reborn 100 of this suit because it's it's pretty cool and we don't have one. I'll say this. Two things. Number one, the Gerbera looked great here. Dare I say even better than in 0083, especially because we see it so briefly in 0083, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Here we see much better angles of it. Number two, in many ways, the Gerber Tetra design wise feels ahead of its time because just visually it looks like it would absolutely be at home in a lot of the recent non-uc series oh yeah i agree i agree 100 mm-hmm. percent. decades ahead of its time just a very modern look to it and all that it would have been at home in that that prelude to the the witch from mercury yeah so, yeah you know and in the uc i would say at a minimum it would be home in the zeta era yeah, it it could definitely pass with with how wacky things got. <laughs> sort of yeah, wacky. yeah, or the double Zeta era, yeah, even yeah. you know, even the victory crossbone era. I think it would. Yeah, it has enough curves, uh, just like Shima does. <laughs> <laughs> Zing. <laughs> yeah, the the design team they they did a heck of a job. But um, you know, yeah. you know me, Brian. If I see red, I think Shar. So as far as I'm concerned, it should have gotten a paint job. <laughs> Would you have preferred that she painted it in um, her purple and in, in like gold? Absolutely, yeah. Or you know, even do a throwback and um, they do their their uh, marine camo. Oh, yeah, yeah, that would be cool, too. Why did they stop with the Marine Camo? You think, my headcanon would have to be that close to the one-year war, the Federation engineers, they they figured out sensor-wise what to do to defeat that camo. Well, it has to be something like that, because you read the description and you think, well, why don't they just paint all suits like this? Or ships, you know? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. The ships certainly need some help, because people like Gatto just walk in front of them and shoot them down, so. Yeah, oh, God, yeah. Did you notice, Isaac, that the ending to this short was a song I hadn't heard before? It was It's an English version of the uh, 0083 ending song. So the 0083 ending song from, I think it's episodes 8 through 13, is called uh, Evergreen. It's, yeah. I think it's by Mio. But the, the ending to this one is an English version of that song called Starbright. And uh, it was great. I loved it. So I'm going to add that to my playlist. Yeah, I really liked it. And that song has such a a bittersweet kind of tragic melody to it. I wouldn't say it's a complete downer, but you know, it's very much sad to go end credits. Yeah. Well, it's perfect for this short, right? Yeah. And it it absolutely fit how, how at least me as a Shima fan, how, and I assume you, you're, you're a Shima fan yourself, even though you're majority. Uh, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, we were, we were so sad to see how her life ended up and the things she'd gone through and, you know, her, her tragic death. Very, very fitting. I'm glad we got to hear in English because you know me, I'm pro dub. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yeah so this is a great short uh mayfly space one was was fun but it was like three minutes long not a whole lot in there mayfly space two definitely recommended if you haven't seen it you know because if you if you bought the dvds at w83 back in the day mayfly space two didn't exist so it's only from 2016 um so unless you had you know listened to this from the <laughs> the stardust memory cd cinema episodes from the early 90s i highly doubt that you 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 know knew about this so Check it out on YouTube. Someone's got it up, you know, with subs and everything. So highly recommend it if you like WA3. So Isaac, this brings us to our final short that we're talking about tonight. This is not really a Shima short per se, but Shima's involved, and it relates to the GPO4 slash the Gaburra. So again, as part of UC Engage, there was a cutscene where Shima, in her Gelgug Marine Commander, uh, takes on Pesh, who's piloting the GPO4, but in a finished version. So the canon lore, as far as I know, is still that the GPO-4 was never completed. It was developed up to a certain extent that it was in suitable shape to give to Xeon, but it had never been fully assembled or tested like a Gundam. 
Right. However, this is not true in the recent, you know, double eighty three manga adaptation, which we just talked about, Rebellion. So in that, in Rebellion, the GPO four is finished, and they test it at the same time that they test the GPO one Fulvernian on the moon. But the events of Rebellion still don't match this short. So either this short is a retcon of the existing continuity that says GPO four was never finished, or it's just a what if. That said, I think it's an easy retcon if they wanted to just say that this is now the new the new canon, because they could just say that this test of the GPO-4 versus Shima was never public knowledge and it was always secret, and therefore the lore is still sort of intact. It was just never officially recorded. Because they did end up giving it to Shima, right? So they obviously it was somewhat functional when they gave it to her. So it's not sure. a leap to say that she was like, well, let me test it out first, you know, pilot it against me. So I guess make your own headcanon, Isaac. I mean... Do you like it better if they finished it and she tested it out like this? Or did you prefer them giving it to her unfinished? I guess finished makes more sense because she doesn't strike me as a person who would take something that was unfinished, right? Yeah, not a lot, yeah. not a lot of time passed either. It's not like they had time to make a whole new suit or anything. So I don't know. I, I could buy it. But, uh, you know, I don't know what the official word is. I do know that someone, the, the version I, that we watched didn't have any subtitles. I swear I watched one with subtitles at some point. But they've, they've been taken down. YouTube's been taken down a lot of these UC Engage clips. So, you know, if you watch one, don't be surprised to see it gone three months later. So I think maybe <laughs> the one I had watched that had subtitles before, I think has been taken down. Especially after we watch it, like Last Blitz of Xeon, where... <laughs> We, tor- yeah, yeah. we torpedoed it, and they immediately removed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, clearly they listened to our podcast, and they were like, oh, they didn't like it. <laughs> those those idiots at Sunset, they're watching it. <laughs> Get it off. Delete Ruining our uploads. uploads. <laughs> <laughs> but for those who haven't seen it, I mean, you know, go go punch in Shima and, and uh, GPO4, and Shima dukes it out with Pesh, and Shima kind of takes Pesh for a ride here, Isaac. The GPO4 looks great, though. It's really cool to see another unit of the Gundam Development Project animated in nice animation. This animation was a bit better than the Gato one, maybe? Yeah. It was shorter. It was only, this one was only like a minute, I think. Yeah. But I like this short because it, it scratches two itches, Isaac. It, was, it gave us more Shima and a Gundam that we hadn't seen animated before. Right, yeah. And, I mean, we don't see a ton of the Gundam, but right, yeah, no, it looked cool. You know, I, I thought the eyes were a little big, but it still looked cool. <laughs> But I did read that in the comments, someone did say that in this scene, she does say that she will be taking the machine. So it does appear to be some sort of test fight that they're having. Besides the lore saying that GPO-4 was never finished, it still lines up with this short if you assume that she takes it afterwards. So that that part is still intact. It's not like, you know, they're fighting to the death or anything. It, at least to me, it, it's, it seemed like a test fight, right? Right, yeah. And... um I mean, I guess it performed well, you know, it definitely came off as maneuverable. Yeah, and Pesh doesn't seem like the most ace pilot type person, so I think Shima was just kind of getting used to it, but I enjoyed it. I, I thought it was cool to see Shima again. The the, the Gelgug Marine Commander looked great, as usual. Cool shield, yeah. So there you go, Isaac. That was that was a good dose of Shima there. That's not to say this is all the Shima side story content. There's probably some stuff out there. I know she's in some of the games. I think there's some maybe some Gearin's Greed or maybe even Encounters in Space alternate stuff where she goes into the Titans or something like that. But um, at least in terms of official lore, and I mean, again, this UCN gauge, I don't know that it's really official. It might be more of a what if, but I think it's passable. So yeah, I'm, uh, after watching these specials, you know, Isaac, I hadn't watched the original Mayfly of Space since way back when, in 2002 or whatever, when we got those DVDs. But uh, the new Mayfly of Space was great. I, I really enjoyed that. So again, if you're a Double A Three fan, go check out Mayfly of Space, uh, especially number two. You could almost just not even watch number one. Uh, the second one is is what like 11 minutes. It's so much more. It's so much longer. It's almost half an episode. Yeah, it's, it's great. It's exactly what it should have been. The first one, I vaguely remember that like. It was based on an audio drama or or something like that, right? There were, yeah, yeah. It was on that CD. It was on the ep- It was on the soundtrack, and uh, they're both they're both adapting the same thing. I think it just adapts more of it the second time. So yeah, they were really squeezing uh, water from a stone. <laughs> so <laughs> not a lot to go on. <laughs> but hey, here's you go. Here's some fresh content. <laughs> Yeah, so that concludes our, our look at the Nightmare of Solomon out of Elgato and the Mayfly of Space, Shima Garahau. I think that was fun. I, I enjoy these these ace pilot sort of side stories. I hope we get more of them in the future, you know, whether it's through these mobile game or video game cutscenes or just these one-shot mangas. 
I think they're fun, and I think they really expand the lore, and that's that's a good example of why I like the Gundam franchise, right? There's always these little nooks and crannies for you to for you to inhabit if you're nerdy enough. You know, like those people that found the the red Rick Dom, and they were like <laughs> the red Dom Tropper, and they were like, "No, you have to tell me what it is. What is it?" You know. The, so the, the Gundam nerds that like pushed their glasses up their nose and were like, uh, "Excuse me." <laughs> <laughs> the Dom Tropin was clearly only for Earth-based that combat. That is not a space Dom. <laughs> <laughs> what is wrong with How you? did it get in the hangar? <laughs> <laughs> Why is it here? Why is it so far from Earth? <laughs> How did Delaz let this happen? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, any closing thoughts, Isaac? Yeah, Gato and Shima. Me and Brian, since we kind of came up through 0083 into Gundam, we've clearly set our thoughts on it, but I'm really curious what you, the listeners, think about Gato and Shima. What's your opinions on them? Are are they essentially just pure out-and-out war criminals who should have almost (laughs) no pity? Do they have no redeeming qualities? Or are they pretty well-done characters that are tragic villains or even tragic protagonists, if you think about it? So, yeah, tell us what you think about Gato, Shima. You don't necessarily have to compare them or contrast them, but just, you know, on their own. And um, if you've seen this this content also, or if you decide to watch it after listening to this podcast, you know, tell us what you thought about what you actually saw. Absolutely. And then also let us know what other characters you think Sunrise should do things like this for. Is it Shin Master Naga? Is it Johnny Raiden? Is it some more obscure ones? I would like to see some more Federation ones, Isaac. We don't hear, we hear a lot about Xeon Ace pilots. You don't hear a whole lot about the federation guys yeah then that might just be unfortunately because of like the time handicap so to speak like because the war goes on so long before the federation pilots even get their mobile suits so yeah that's true yeah but there's still no reason we can't you know like again like we said the immortal fourth team or um other, other similar aces or groups of aces it's all just waiting there we'd all love to see it Agreed. All right, Isaac, take us away. All right, listeners, before you go to sleep tonight, stand next to your bed, get on your knees, put your hands together, look up at the ceiling, and hail the Delaz fleet. Good night, everybody.